Gotta have this. You never know. I may want to do some pastels. You never know about the weather. Comforts everything when you travel. And I can't go anywhere without a chicken. Don't mind me, I'm just getting ready for a quick trip. You know, whether you're a jet setter or an armchair traveler, going to new and different, even exciting places is a great way to gather up ideas for your home and your garden. In today's show, I want to take you on a journey to some inspiring destinations. No, I don't think so. I gotta get going here. Yeah, it seems like I always forget something. Here we go. Founded in 1766 by a Protestant religious group known as the Moravians, the town of Salem has a deep and rich history. The Moravian church and Salem residents kept meticulous records and accounts of their lives, their interactions, their buildings and landscapes, and their evolution into the town of Winston-Salem. On a recent trip to North Carolina, I had the privilege of touring the town with the president of Old Salem Museums and Gardens, Reagan Folan. Reagan, it's such a thrill to be back at Old Salem. It's such a special and really unique place. It really is. You know, the Moravians founded the town of Salem in 1766, and today we interpret life back then with these beautiful historic buildings. Oh, and they've been so well cared for and beautifully restored. Thank you. We're really proud of that, and, and it just really enhances the visitor's experience to see life as it was in these original buildings. And of course, I love the gardens. Well, of course you do. <laughs> We're really proud of the historic gardens here, and I really think it makes um, this whole town come alive with all that beauty. Well, it's, it's so layered and so comprehensive, and there's so many aspects of Old Salem that animate this place and bring it to life. I completely agree with you, and the gardens clearly are at the top of that list. And it's a beautiful fabric, really. It is, it is, thank you. Reagan, we can learn so much from the past. What do you think a, a visitor to Old Salem today would find relevant to their lives? Well, I think there's so much to learn from the past. Um, a great example is at the Mitch House, where you see a kitchen garden sure. that's really relatively small, but right. really supported Manageable. the family. Right, yeah. and anybody could go to their home and do the very same in a suburban lot in their own backyard. And of course, Reagan, with so much interest in growing your own food, local food, you can come here and see great organic and sustainable practices in these gardens. Without question. And I think it's really important for children to learn, you know, where their food comes from, learn more about gardening. Hopefully we're cultivating our next generation of gardeners. Well, I couldn't agree more. But you know, it's interesting. So many of the things that the children who were here, the Moravian children, uh, what they were learning is really no different than what you're teaching today to the children who visit this place. And that's really what we try to get across to children today, that we can learn from our past, it informs the present, and children back then were learning many of the same subjects, maybe a little bit differently, but sure. it's, it's basically all the same. And I think it really resonates with children when they realize that. I think so too. Well, keep up the great work here at Old Salem. Thank you. Real pleasure to that. be here. Thank you, we're thrilled to have you. Still to come on Garden Style, what it takes to style some of America's most lavish and visited mansions, plus the recipe to a delicious Southern classic. So stay tuned. Trudy, I have to say, I am totally knocked out by the transformation that's occurred here. The last time I was here, well, there was virtually nothing back here. Well, when this garden was uh, restored in 2001 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the elms in this property, this was a heap. Every bit of sculpture had been destroyed or vandalized. Mm. None of the fountains worked. None of these gardens were in place. This has undergone a major, major transformation. It certainly has. And it's so historically accurate because you have all of these documents That's from right. the period. The garden was 
started in 1907. And one of the things that we were lucky at finding were the blueprints, I guess, of the, yes. of the garden itself. And they were blown up into huge, huge sizes and large pieces of paper were laid along these banks. Almost like you were laying out a parquet floor. Exactly. For this and garden room. Punched through so that each one of these scrolls is exactly where it was in 1914 when the garden was created to begin with. So That's fantastic. it's a wonderful in the dirt kind of restoration conservation story. Well, it's such a beautiful example of classical revival here in New Newport. This is a very hard garden to maintain. It requires a lot of attention. And precision. And precision. With all these clipped hedges. That's which right. is really what brings that formality to the top. Imagine being a guest of the Berwins and walking down the steps of that house along this broad expanse with these beautiful beech trees that were obviously not as big then. Well, that's one of the spectacular elements of the right. property. And then coming up to this French pavilion designed after the Petit Trianon at Versailles, walking down those stairs and voila, there's this magic sunken garden. The element of surprise. Oh, just wonderful. Yeah, no, it is, it is. What a treat for visitors. And then as you approach it, you see that beautiful alley and you look to the right and you look to the left and you see these fountains. There were three fountains along the Allee. All three of them had been vandalized and damaged over decades. Really? So they all three had to be built from the ground up. Yes. And that was really one of the most important features of the garden. Right, because so they, they had were to focal be done. points exactly. at either end, yeah. yeah. And the Allee itself, I think, is unique because at the beginning of the restoration, it too was covered with massive amounts of debris and compost and uh, it had no line to it. All of these trees are newly planted except for that beach. Mm. They reflect what had been there again based on the design plans from 1907 and 1914. I know the Preservation Society is very proud of this restoration work. Thank you. I'm in the Breakers, which is the Vanderbilt Mansion here in Newport, Rhode Island. And let me tell you, it's quite the place. The Breakers is one of 14 historic properties and landscapes that the Preservation Society of Newport County protects and maintains, making it the state's largest and most visited cultural organization. With the mission of preserving the architectural heritage of Newport County, there's a lot of work that goes into making these properties available and appealing to the public. Lots of people see the Breakers every year, over 400,000 visitors. Now, some of the touches that make this such a special place are, well, flower arrangements like this, cut fresh and delivered daily. Becky, these flowers are just gorgeous. Yes. Mm, this peony, smell yes. that. Oh. <laughs> I just can't believe how many flower arrangements you produce for all of these houses. And we do probably 13 to 15 arrangements daily, you know, throughout the houses. We have a crew that goes out in the morning and replenishes the flowers and replaces if there's some that are too far gone. Right, so Becky, when you're creating an arrangement, give me an idea of what you think about. It all depends too on the container. You wanna do well, the appropriate size. They usually say- Yeah, it needs to be in proportion. Yes, proportion. But I usually start off with my greens. So I build like um, a nice little nest uh -huh. to hold yeah, um, some flowers. Great. And then I go in with my big ones, my big bulky ones. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of work my way out with my smaller ones. Sure. So you create a framework yes. first with the greenery. Yes. Yeah. And yep. then that gets your size. And then you fill in with I the big in. bold flowers like yep. you've used here, the roses and I see chrysanthemums. Yes, and then I go in with like status uh -huh. or just where I feel smaller, like there might be a hole. Smaller and smaller and mm smaller. -hmm. Yep. And then just start filling in. Yeah. Now this Lazy Susan is something that I use at home and it makes it really it's easy, great. doesn't it? It you can does. begin to move them around. Yep. You just do a colossal job here. Oh. Hats off to you. Thank you very Keep much. I work. appreciate it. <laughs> You're <laughs> Thank welcome. you so much. Break out the forks and knives. After the break, we head to Memphis and get cooking. Don't go away.
On my last trip to Memphis, I had the opportunity to check out a restaurant whose casual fare rivals the creativity of any white tablecloth venue. Here's a delicious collard green recipe. Yes, that's right, delicious, from Chef Michael Hudman of Hog and Hominy. Well, we first kind of got into cooking with our grandmothers. We used to go over to their house on uh, Sundays. Every Sunday, same thing. You know, you get up, you go to church, Mama's got lunch prepared. Our grandmother's always adapted Southern food. She'd always go to the market. It's like Friday, she'd go to the beauty shop and go to the market. You know, that was like her ritual. And she'd always get two, uh, two sackfuls of collard Two sackfuls of collards. She'd say a half a sack of collard greens can feed a big boy, so. The process of our collards is, we start with pit and bacon, render that down with a little bit of that Georgia olive oil or whatever. If you were to make it for probably like four people, you're gonna use a couple good tablespoons of olive oil just to get that bacon rolling and then... Like four strips of bacon yeah, cut up? Yeah, four strips of bacon cut up. So once the bacon starts to do its thing, starting to release out, mix it with that olive oil, we're gonna add in our onion. So just one white onion, one Spanish onion, or whatever onions in season, whatever you can find, you know. Season our onions. And then we're gonna add in a secret ingredient which is uh, uh, this induya. One of the salamis that Andy and I ate when we were living in Italy. It's uh, made by uh, Aaron Winters, our head charcuterie guy. It's a completely spreadable salami, so if you look at it, it's been cured, but it's still very, very soft. We always just met like a thumb-sized piece of induya. If you add too much of that stuff, don't blow your head. Yeah, it's pretty hot, off. it's pretty hot. Um, but if you don't have that, you can leave that out and add maybe like a little smoked paprika to it. You cook you that down in a paste? Yeah, yeah, paste it out, yeah. and then add the collards. And then that's when we add, so like I was saying, if you're gonna do a grocery bag of collards, like a big paper paper bag for four people, it should be enough. Yeah, so you pick off the stems, you kind of hand tear it, and then you put it in there with it, add the, uh, the pork stock, and uh, cook it down. This is, our, this is our pork stock. We roast off pork bones, add some prosciutto to it, a little bit of mirepoix. That's what we're gonna cook the collards in. Then turn it on a simmer and let it go for like an hour or 45 minutes, just depending on how you like it. And then um, if you're going right from the pot to the table, add your hominy. If you don't have fresh hominy with two cups of canned hominies, wrenched off is, is pretty, it's, it's cool. Much more garden style straight ahead, including a trip to Northwest Arkansas, where art, history, and beautiful scenery collide. So stay tuned. I know, I know, I get it. You're going to Northwest Arkansas to Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. And you know what? You're gonna love it because it's one of the most spectacular places to visit in Arkansas. But did you know, while you're up there in Northwest Arkansas, there's some great places to find some delicious food, some of the best in the state. In fact, four Bentonville chefs were invited to cook at the James Beard Foundation in New York because, well, they're just that good. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to create the Northwest Arkansas itinerary for you that will include art, gardens, and of course, food. Of course, I'm gonna take the scenic route and follow the pig trail, because no matter the season, the views are spectacular. Now, since we've got a very full day planned, we need some fuel. Breakfast fuel. I like to get started at Mama Carmen's Espresso Cafe. Not only do I get a delicious cup of coffee, but proceeds from each cup go to orphans around the world. Mmm, that's good. There's so much to do in Fayetteville, everything from going to the Botanic Garden, Dixon Street Books, Terra Studios, and of course, you gotta go to the stadium and call the hogs. Woo! Pig suey! Razorbacks! I'm a sucker for any historic town, especially one that looks and feels like downtown Rogers. It's filled with antique shops, unique stores, and home to a museum dedicated to one of the most memorable movie props of all time. I want an official Red Rider Carbon Action 200 shot range model air rifle. You know, it doesn't really matter that that actual model that 
Ralphie talks about in the movie didn't actually exist until after the movie, then they made lots of them. But it's fun to come to the Daisy Air Gun Museum and see how this company started here in Rogers in 1958. Of course, no trip to Rogers would be complete without a delicious homemade meal from Heirloom Food and Wine. Everything is made from scratch using only fresh local ingredients. Your grandmother never believed in processed foods and neither does Heirloom Food and Wine. Okay, now that we've made our way up to Bentonville and to Crystal Bridges, it's time to take in the marvel of this place. I know, it's amazing. But just in case you had a little extra time, the Compton Gardens are a truly beautiful green space oasis that serves as a public park. And if you're interested in digging into a deeper part of American history, the Museum of Native American History has artifacts dating over 14,000 years ago. What a full day. I've seen so many exciting things. But you know, at the end of such a busy day, it's nice to just sort of kick back, relax, enjoy a glass of wine, maybe a meal, in a place that's elegant, but not too stuffy. Petit Bistro is a French Mediterranean restaurant that's sure to please. Delicious five-star recipes that are the perfect way to end a great day in Northwest Arkansas. Now remember, there's so many wonderful and interesting things to do here and all over Arkansas, and the best way to find them is to go to Arkansas.com. Now I hear some live music somewhere, I'm gonna go check it out. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. And make sure you sign up for our weekly newsletter. Stop by and stay a while. Okay, we'll be back right after a short break. Well, what a fun trip. My gosh, and the memories. Now it's time to get all of this unpacked. You know, I think travel is much more about just going to the sites. Think about all the great people you meet and all the things that you get to see that, well, you can only imagine unless you encounter them firsthand. Travel's a great way to change your perspective on the world and also discover some new things. I hope I'll see you soon when we can visit again. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. Wow, it's really high up here. What is that guy doing up there? I'm a hopeless hog caller and you're trying to help me. Okay. okay. All right, All right. you have your hands down and then you- Hands down. And you're like, woo, woo. So you say that and then you go pig. Pig, suey. Oh, it's pig it. back, suey forward. Mm -hmm. And then you do it one more time. Okay, raise her back. Yes. Trying to get the cadence down here. Yeah. 